Thank you. And thank you for this wonderful opportunity. Um, so we're going to be uh, speaking about some ethical considerations on quadratic voting. It's a voting mechanism in which uh, uh, vo voters purchase votes. The price of votes is, the is proportional to the square of the number of votes that's purchased. And the issue, uh, the alternative for which the most votes have been purchased wins. Um, and Lally and Weil present a model in which QV is approximately efficient in large populations. And Posner and Weil propose a political application of QV as a method for selecting legislation and candidates. And they argue that it's superior to majority rule. One person, one vote. Mm -hmm. um, so in this paper, uh, we are exploring, we're going to explore some ethical considerations on voting uh, with a view to evaluating the normative case for QV over majority rule in the political context. So if there are ethical considerations that speak against uh, the buying and selling of votes, we want to know what they are. Um, and in light of all the relevant ethical considerations, uh, we want to know how QV and majority rule compare. Um, so the most intuitive pressing concern about QV is sort of the thing that will first spring to mind to anyone who hears about uh, this or other vote buying schemes like it is that it transforms economic inequality into political inequality. And in this paper, we uh, try to factor this out into two related concerns. Um, the first is a utilitarian concern. And the second is a concern about democratic legitimacy. Um, so uh, when we're exploring the utilitarian concern, uh, we begin from the, the following observation, uh, that for any fixed level of preference intensity, the wealthy will be more willing to pay for votes than the poor. If voter preferences are independent of wealth, then quadratic voting is utilitarian preferred to majority voting. Uh, however, uh, if voter preferences are polarized by wealth, then majority voting may be superior. Um, and when it comes to uh, democratic legitimacy, we're going to argue that uh, in the presence of inequalities of wealth, any vote buying me mechanism, including QV, will have a difficult time meeting a democratic legitimacy requirement. Okay, so um, we're going to start with a sort of uh, simplified version of uh, the model. Probably some of this is not necessary now because you've seen QV all morning, but we're going to be using a, a sort of price-taking equilibrium model, which is a simple uh, version of the model that was in the original uh, paper by Lally and Weil. Um, it's really just a heuristic model, and the key property that we need is only that, you know, voters buy votes in proportional to their willingness to pay. That's really all we're we're using, and due to time limitations, I'm not going to study the whole model, even that simple version. I'm just going to look at the voters' optimization problem, okay? So, okay, let's think about uh, quadratic voting. Just to set up our notation in comparison to the other notation that you've seen, you know, we've got a binary election. X could be 0 or 1, okay? You pay V squared dollars to purchase V votes. Once those votes are purchased, the alternative with the most votes wins the election and the election proceeds are refunded equally to all citizens, okay? So uh, to break down the different elements, uh, you know, let's say that we make a normalization that my value to option zero is zero and then my, op my value to option one is either one, uh, sorry, is u and u is either positive or negative depending on whether I prefer one or I prefer a zero, okay? Let q you know, be the probability that x equals 1 would win if I didn't vote, okay? So essentially what I care about is influence, and the way to think about influence is just shifting that probability up or down, right? I want to buy influence and move that probability around. So let capital I be the amount of influence that I, I purchase, um, and it might be positive or negative because it's the additional or lesser probability that, that uh, option 1 wins. Okay, and there's a conversion between votes and influence. Um, so let's say that there's a price P and V votes translates into P times I un units of influence, uh, or sorry, P votes is P times I. And so P we can think of as like the price of uh, 
influence, okay? And 1 over p is the marginal pivotality, right? The additional influence that you get with another vote, okay? So let's think about now why, you know, you've already seen this before, but it'll be useful to go through this. Why does quadratic voting wor work? Well, let's think about the voters' problem. They want to max, they want to select influence so as to maximize the expected value of the outcome minus the vote cost. We just look at the first order condition, just set the derivative equal to zero, you know, and solve for i in terms of the other values. So we basically get that the voter purchases i over 2p squared units of influence, which multiplying by p amounts to, sorry, u over 2p squared, which multiplying by p amounts to u over 2p votes, okay? And the key thing is just that this is proportional to u. Um, and so what that means is that because the voters purchase votes in proportion to their utility, then the outcome that maximizes the sum of utilities is going to win the election, okay? So, okay, now majority voting, does majority voting have this nice property? Well, that the thing that maximizes the sum of utilities is going to win the election. It's very easy to see that it doesn't have this property. So just imagine Ann, Bob, and Carol. Ann and Bob both have a utility of 1 for the option that they like. Carol has a utility of negative 3. According to majority voting, you know, option 1 wins, but option 0 should win according to utilitarianism because the sum of, or summing the utilities because uh, the sum of utilities is bigger under option 0. Okay, so what we want to bring into this is the possibility that voters are unequal uh, uh, with respect to each other. So let's suppose that we have some inequality, okay? And uh, WEI is the wealth endowment of voter I, okay? And the voter's utility is uh, split into two uh, components. There's, you know, first there's UI times X. That's their utility from the outcome. Remember, X is equal to either 0 or 1. So if x is equal to 0, it's 0, like in our normalization. And if it's equal to 1, then it's ui. And then the second part of the utility is their utility of wealth. Okay, so g of wi is the utility that you get from holding wealth wi. And the one thing that we're going to assume is that this exhibits a diminishing marginal utility uh, of wealth. Okay, so this is a very important slide for, for us. We really want to be thinking about, uh, you know, uh, quadratic voting in, a, in an ethical way. We're adopting the theory of utilitarianism. The way that we understand that theory is that um, you know, we have some independent notion of utility which is interpersonally comparable and in ethically significant units. So you might want to imagine that there's some sort of ethical observer, utilitarian ethical observer, whose judgments we're, we're talking about and who can trade off you know, the utilities of different uh, agents, and we're going to look at what that ethical observer would prefer, okay? And so this, this utility, which is in ethically significant units, consists of the utility of the outcome and also the utility of wealth. And we assume that everybody has the same utility of wealth function, but different endowments, okay? So now that the refund becomes ethically significant, we heard about this earlier today because you could be transferring money from people with different marginal utility of wealth, right? So what effect is the, is the refund going to have in general? This is sort of the earlier talk today sort of touched on this. Well, let's, we have almost the same idea here. You know, imagine that we have two groups of voters. We have a and B, A are the passionate voters that really care about the election, are going to buy a lot of votes. B are the indifferent voters who are going to buy zero or close to zero votes. Okay, and so effectively the refund is going to be a transfer of wealth from A to B. And we haven't said anything about the sizes of A and B or about the wealth levels of A and B. So basically the utility effect of the refund could be anything. Okay, and so basically to abstract away from this we want to neutralize this effect. Um, and so basically we're going to imagine that we, in order to neutralize this ambiguous utility effect, we're going to imagine that we live in a society in which redistribution via the refund is prohibited. So the, way, the device that we're going to use to, you know, to, to formalize that is we're going to imagine that there's a collection C of citizens, a collection N of non-citizens, 
Non-citizens are not allowed to vote, but they also don't care about the outcome of the election. Every dollar raised through the election from a citizen I is transferred to a non-citizen J with the same marginal utility of wealth. So you only make transfers within wealth levels. And that's a constraint that we're operating on. And therefore, the, the, the transfer is neutral in a utility sense. Okay? So you know, the motivation for doing this, you know, I think it's already somewhat apparent. But also, the no redistribution constraint allows us to really focus on the utilitarian assessment of the election outcome, which I think a lot of the papers on QV are really focusing primarily on the evaluation of the outcome, which we want to do from a utilitarian point of view. It allows us to deal with the ambiguity, and it's also you know, more parallel to Lal and Wally's sort of quasi-linear model where it doesn't matter where the, the distribution goes. Okay, so once you do that, because the, the wealth, you know, wealth is only going to be transferred from somebody to somebody else with the same marginal utility of wealth, that goes away. And the only thing that the utilitarian uh, observer cares about is the sum of utilities due to the outcome of the election. Okay, so for simplicity, I'm just, just to, this is inessential, but just to make the calculations easier, I'm just going to assume that we have a piecewise linear utility function of, of wealth. So, you know, you've got the, the, the red region, which are the poor people. BI is the marginal utility of wealth. That's high. It's smaller in the green region and smaller in, in the, the blue region after that. And we're going to assume that the transfers that are made through the election never take a person from one region to the other. That's just going to make the calculations you know, simple and transparent. OK, so let's just think about uh, the voters problem now. OK, so under QV, the vote cost function is V squared. For the moment, you'll see why on the next slide, I'm going to allow there to be voter-specific cost functions. I'm relaxing the problem. And let's say everybody's got their own vote cost function. It might be QV. It might be something else. So in general, then, you know, in our problem, you know, it's going to look very similar. The, the voters' optimization problem is going to be maximize the expect, choose influence so as to maximize the expected utility of the outcome plus the wealth utility after buying votes, right? And so that's, that's going to be the thing that the voter maximizes. If you use the piecewise linearity and recall that B is the marginal utility of wealth at the wealth endowment, the expression simplifies to the second equation, okay? And we can get rid of the GWEI because that's just a constant. It doesn't affect the, the voter's problem. Uh, as far as choosing the, the influence, if we divide through by BI, you know, that doesn't affect. That's just a positive number. That's not going to affect the um, optimal influence. Okay? And then what's going to happen is if we impose now QV for everybody, everybody has QV as their cost function, then people are not, they're going to still purchase votes in proportion to their willingness to pay, but what, but what they're going to purchase votes in proportion to is their utility divided by um, their, the marginal utility of, their marginal utility of wealth, right? And so because uh, rich people have a smaller marginal utility of wealth, they're going to purchase votes disproportionately to their utility. They're going to purchase disproportionately more votes than their utility. Poor people are going to purchase disproportionately fewer votes than utility. The analysis is identical as what I showed you on the first slide. Okay? By another manipulation, what we could do is just multiply back through by BI. Okay? That's not going to affect anything. And now we're going to use those voter-specific cost functions, and we're going to make a wealth adjustment to QV. So instead of QV, we're going to have 1 over BI, the marginal utility of wealth, times uh, v squared. Okay, if you do that, so basically poor people, uh, because they have a higher marginal utility of wealth, are going to pay less for votes. Rich people are going to pay more for votes, but it's still going to be quadratic for everybody. And that will just result back in QV. And so if you really are utilitarian and you, know, you want the utilitarian optimum to come out of this, um, then you should use this wealth weighted uh, version of QV. Okay? Now, okay, QV, it's already going to be, I think, a tough sell to actually have QV in the political process. And I think that this version, where the price of votes is going to be conditional on your wealth level, is going to be even more difficult um, 
is, is going to be even more difficult. So we're going to put it aside uh, for the rest of the talk. Okay, finally on this utilitarian part, let me just talk about two you know, main polar cases that I, we think are important. Let's just split the voters into two classes, rich and poor. Imagine that all the rich have the same wealth endowment, all the poor have the same wealth endowment, the rich have more than the poor. More than half are poor. And the two cases that we care about is um, issues independent of wealth, so the utility distribution is the same at every wealth level, okay? Or issues polarized by wealth, and that is that all the rich people agree that option zero is the best and have the same utility for it. All the poor people agree that option one is the best and have the same utility for it. Okay, of course, if issues are independent of wealth, then, you, then QV is utilitarian optimal because it just wins within each wealth level, right? And all the wealth levels are the same, so it's going to win and it's going to give you the utilitarian optimal outcome, so it's better than majority voting. What happens if we're in the polarized by wealth? Well, then there's three regions. Right? The, the majority voting, the poor people will always win because there's more of them. If their utility is really low, then their total utility, right? if the utility of the poor people, we're going to fix the rich people's utility at negative one and vary the poor people's utility. If it's really low, then the poor people's favorite is going to win under majority voting, but QV um, is going to take into account this, this difference in intensity and it's going to have the, the utilitarian preferred thing win. Okay, and so QV is going to be better. So that's sort of the tyranny uh, of the majority region that Eric and uh, Glenn are, are talking about, we think. Then if utility gets higher above a certain threshold, in aggregate actually the, the total utility that the, the poor people are going to get out of the, the, uh, uh, their preferred outcome is bigger, but because QV weights the rich people's you know, utility by more, because they vote more proportional to their utility, the, the, um, the, the, the rich people's thing is going to win under uh, a QV, and it would have been better to do majority voting. So that's the corrupting influence of money region. Finally, if the utility gets so high, it's actually going to persuade QV to go along with it as well, and then the two methods are going to generate the same outcome, and that's, it doesn't matter how you count. By that we mean by willingness to pay versus by votes. Okay. So finally, our takeaway is that there's no straightforward uh, utilitarian argument for QV over majority voting. It depends. QV maximizes the sum of willingnesses to pay, not the sum of utilities in an ethically significant sense. Um, it's efficient, but it's not necessarily utilitarian optimal. So up to now, it's ambiguous. And now we're going to look at considerations, other considerations that we think are more decisive uh, against QV. Um, okay, so let's let's put these utilitarian considerations aside, uh, and we're going to consider the relation of QV to other democratic values. Um, so let's let's do this by returning to the question: What what problem was QV designed to solve? Um, so here's a quote from Lally and Weil. Um, um, but now uh, I'd like to draw your attention to the breadth of questions that the political system addresses. So consider decisions about whether to allow abortion, euthanasia, gambling, prostitution, the sale of organs, decisions about whether to go to war, whether to increase our stockpile of uh, world-ending nuclear weapons, the progressivity of the tax system, about redistributive transfers, about how we ought to deal with climate change, and, and so on. I think what's, what's apparent when one reminds oneself about the, the full gamut of these questions is that they involve more than efficiency. So, I mean, just take one, take abortion. At least part of the question of abortion is whether uh, abortion is murder. And that's not primarily a question, or at all, a question about efficiency. Um, but even issues such as climate change, in which efficiency certainly does figure centrally, um, even issues like that contain other important social values and moral dimensions. Um, for example, what as a matter of justice we owe to future generations. Um, so if, you, if we reflect on these decisions and we um, sort of ask about some of their general properties, um, I think three things emerge. Uh, the first is that they're very large-scale decisions about the institutions of our society. They affect um, great numbers of, huge numbers of people, uh, and they're backed by the coercive power of the state. So they're high-stakes decisions. 
Um, and furthermore, they involve a variety of social values, um, as we just <coughs> indicated. Uh, and the third point is that they are uh, regularly and ineliminably subject to disagreement, either because people disagree about the underlying values or because they uh, draw different policy conclusions from the values that they share. Um, and, and we think these three features uh, suggest that um, these kinds of public decisions face a democratic legitimacy requirement. Um, this is a requirement that concerns the process of making the decision and not just the outcome. So it's about who should get to decide and on what terms. Um, and we, we, we think of this as having two components. So for major public decisions, we think um, on the one hand that citizens should be consulted. Uh, and on the other hand, that they have an equal opportunity to influence the outcome. Um, so to, to make this, render this vivid, let's just consider an example. So suppose that we have uh, two nations that are facing an identical decision about whether to go to war. I mean, the considerations are the same for each nation. Um, and suppose in nation A, the decision is made by an authoritarian government, whereas in nation D, it's made by a democratic government, that is a democratically controlled government. Uh, now in this case, um, I, I, as I, I hope you'll all agree, uh, in, in nation A, uh, the decision that they make fails to meet the democratic legitimacy requirement. Um, whereas in, in, in nation D, the democratic legitimacy requirement, let's suppose, is met. Now uh, this difference has justificatory consequences uh, of the following kind. The citizens of A, they have a complaint against their government, against the decision they made, that the citizens of D lack. So the citizens of A can say things like, we weren't consulted, we had no say in this decision, and so on. Um, whereas a citizen in D, even someone who rightly opposed the war, let's say, if, if the, um, even, even someone who rightly opposed the war can't issue that complaint. Um, and then a kind of further point is that for some issues, in some cases, it seems like the difference between the way that the decision was made and hence whether the decision was democratically legitimate may be more important than the decision that was made. Okay, so uh, Tobin, uh, he introduced the term uh, specific uh, egalitarianism to describe a demand uh, of equality or more equality uh, with respect to certain specific goods uh, such as healthcare and education. And early on when we were thinking about this in personal communication, uh, Glenn uh, posed a challenge to us uh, which sort of guided some of our, our thinking uh, forward on this. Um, and, and what he wrote was, uh, many have advocated specific egalitarianism for some private goods like healthcare, educations, organs, etc. But in general, people seem to feel that it's okay to have general egalitarianism for most private goods but want to wall off public goods entirely. Is this a coherent position? What other than technological structure makes the categorical difference between public and private goods? Okay, so after thinking about this, you know, our position is that there's an argument for specific equality for the allocation of decision-making authority um, in a democratic society. It's not an argument that some goods, such as public goods, uh, should be allocated, you know, more equally uh, than, than others. It's sort of a requirement at the higher order level of the collective decision making process rather than at the lower order level of the specific allocation or outcome of the decision. Um, so to sort of illustrate what we mean by this higher order equality, let's consider a case that we would all think, I think, fails to meet a democratic legitimacy requirement, which would be a case of arbitrary exclusion. Okay, so let's put QV aside for the moment and imagine uh, that there are two groups R and P and you know citizens in R are allowed to vote under a majority rule citizen, uh, uh, system. Citizens in P are simply excluded from voting. Okay, so if there was no reason for this, you know this would clearly raise issues of legitimacy and citizens P would have a cause for complaint against this system. Okay, so that sort of illustrates you know what we have in mind. Let's finally apply this idea to QV. Okay, so we now can think about QV instead of majority voting, and we could let R stand for rich and P stand for poor in the previous example. Okay, and let's consider the limit 
as the rich become very rich and the poor become prohibitively poor, right? And in the limit, the lim you know, and it, they become so poor actually that it's prohibitively expensive for them to vote. And so in the limit situation, it's essentially the same as the situation in which sim in the previous slide in which citizens for P were simply excluded from voting. Now you might say, well, that's, you know, and citizens in R are allowed to vote. Well, you might say that's unrealistic. It's not really going to be that extreme. Um, but we think that this problem is continuous, right? So um, it, it, it's not as extreme as that, but, but you know, it, the, the more inequality there is, the sort of worse this legitimacy problem is going to be. Um, you know, and I th we think that's distinct from the utilitarian problem. Um, OK, so in conclusion, uh, QV certainly has some advantages over majority voting. It's uh, a means for voters to express the intensity of their preferences and not just yes, no vote. Um, and it's efficient. But we've considered the ethical objection to QV that translates unequal economic resources into unequal political power. And we did that in two ways. So we consider a utilitarian perspective. Um, and here our, our conclusion is that uh, greater demand for votes may stem either from greater preference and intensity or from greater wealth. So that the utilitarian comparison with majority voting is ambiguous, actually. Um, whereas from a democratic perspective, uh, we argued that QV violates a, a, a basic democratic legitimacy requirement uh, that citizens should be consulted on equal terms and have an equal opportunity to influence public decisions, whereas majority voting treats citizens equally and produces decisions that are more democratically legitimate. So that's it. Thank you.